Good morning, Jerusalem. Is it well with your soul? As we move closer to the celebration of Thanksgiving, let us be mindful of all the things that God has brought us through thus far. For all of us, uh, Thanksgiving will be a little different this year in so many ways. Yet, for all those differences, no matter what they are, let us remember that we serve a God that is immutable. That means He never changes because He cannot change. And we say, but we serve a Savior, Jesus Christ. And the scripture said of Him, Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. So, I want to encourage you to remember that in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Turn with me now this morning to Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. That's Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And there we'll find these words written. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Let's pray. God, how blessed we are to have another opportunity to come before you and share your word. We thank you for watching us and keeping us, and strengthening us and guiding us, and helping us, O oh God, just to glorify you in all that we can. Now we pray that you will give us ears to hear and hearts to believe and just be able to do your will. We ask that your word would touch those that need it most. And we thank you not only for what you do, but most of all for who you are. We indeed give thanks to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. This morning, I want to talk about something to be thankful for. Something to be thankful for. This letter that Paul has written to the believers at Colossae begins with him sharing with them the fact that he is very appreciative or thankful for something he had heard about them. Now, this in itself says a great deal because too often we are saddened by what we hear about others particularly in the church in this day and time. While there is much to rejoice about concerning the church, the church also has her share of not-so-good news. There are horror stories of misconduct and malfeasance in many places. The failure to write and divide the Word of God has reduced some pulpits to mere stages of personal showmanship. Praise teams that take the place of many choirs have resorted to entertaining the people rather than singing praises to God. Many churches emphasize building buildings and increasing budgets rather than building people and increasing faith. Struggles for power and personal agendas seek to disrupt the unity and the bond of peace that God has created in the church. And all too often, the mission of the church goes neglected because of complacency among the members, competition among ministers, as well as other misguided actions too numerous to name. But the mature believer is one who knows of the grace of God and that in all things, God is working for good to those that love him and are called according to his purposes. This very fact should always move us to look for good. Yes, no matter what things may look like or no matter what is happening or not happening, we must always look to see what God is doing in the midst of our mess. Now, it's with good reason that we believe that Paul never visited the church of Colossae, but that he did, this did not keep him from writing them to correct some beliefs that could possibly lead them to a strength. First and foremost, he finds something to be thankful for. And as I consider this letter, I'm also thankful to God today for the fact that the same thing that Paul was thankful about, we too can share in that thanksgiving. As a matter of fact, I believe that it will help us tremendously as a church family here at Jerusalem 
to take some time daily to consider the things that we are thankful to God for about this church and pray that he will work in us the good pleasure of his will in all things. And I just want to pause right here and personally thank you, Jerusalem Church, for your proud support, gifts of love, and well wishes toward me and my family during Clergy Appreciation Month and in celebrating my birthday. You didn't have to do it, but you did. And I'm grateful that you did. And God knows I appreciate it. So like Paul, I give thanks to God for you. Well, in the text, Paul writes, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Let me share a few things that Paul was thankful for. And the first thing we notice is that he was thankful to God for their faith in Christ. Now, notice Paul is not thanking them for their faith, but he's thanking God for their faith. He understood something that we must also understand. And that is the fact that we are joined to Jesus Christ by faith. And that faith did not originate with us. It is the gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is as though Paul is saying, I am thankful each time I hear about the fact that God is still saving people and the basis of that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ through the gospel. He is saying that what God has done is nothing short of amazing when you consider it in its totality and its scope. See, God is holy. Man is sinful. And the wrath of God is revealed throughout the history of the world and that same wrath of God is revealed by his judgment upon sinful man. Every man will face God's wrath either in time or in the judgment unless something happens. See, man wants to see God's face in peace, but in his own self-righteousness, he won't be able to do that. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says that by the deeds of the law, no man will be justified. And anybody trying to seek peace with God on his own terms is fighting a losing battle. But thanks be to God, my brothers and sisters, that he has provided a means of righteousness for sinful man, and that comes through faith. That faith is a gift of God. The Bible says in Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever we hear of someone coming to salvation in Christ, it is indeed something we should be thankful to God for because that is good news. Yes, God is still bringing fathers and mothers and uncles and aunts and nieces and nephews and cousins and all kindred and acquaintances to faith in Jesus Christ. But the question is, are you a part of this great salvation endeavor? When was the last time you witnessed someone about Christ? When was the last time you confronted someone about sin and their need for salvation? And I'm not talking about talking to them about stuff that they're doing that you don't like. That's easy to do. But I'm talking about talking to them because you are genuinely concerned about their eternal destiny. Listen, you don't have to be a biblical scholar or a trained theologian to do it either. If you know how you got saved and you are walking in the newness of life, you can share that with others as the opportunity presents itself. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 18 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So yes, it is great that we are new creatures in Christ, but we also need to be seeking new converts for Christ. Then we can join Paul and thank God for their faith in Christ. Well, secondly in the text, Paul thanks God for their love for all the saints. The genuineness of these Christians' faith in Christ was attested to by the fact that it manifested itself in love for all the saints. Now, we're not told on what basis Paul is able to make this assertion other than that he had heard about it. 
but we can be assured that the love they had for all the saints was not mystical or just emotional, but it was practical and actual. It was not something that was just supposed to be, but it was something that could be seen and pointed to and talked about. It was real and tangible, and Paul heard about it. This is a very significant statement because whatever it was that they were doing made it obvious and apparent that they loved all the saints. So what do you suppose it was that they were doing? Well, in particular, we don't know. But it was apparently was motivated by the fact of them knowing that their faith manifested itself through their love. So even as we wonder what they were doing, we do well to ask ourselves, how can we show our love to all the saints? Many people will say, you know, I love you, brother, but it needs to be demonstrated. So what can you do? How can you make your love for the saints more tangible? Well, let me suggest a few things. For one, we must be genuinely concerned with the salvation of people. As a body in Christ, we have united in covenant to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances. Also, our love can be expressed by our prayers for one another, for our association with one another, and by the random acts of kindness toward each other. And listen, the love that God expects of us should not be because of, but in spite of. That's right. No, they may not deserve it. You don't either, but you love them anyway. You know, our Sunday school lesson this month are focusing on godly love among believers. And Brother Roy Jones, as always, is doing an excellent job in reviewing the highlights of the lesson each Saturday at 6 p.m. And we invite all of you to join in the Sunday School Review. These lessons are emphasizing that aspect of the believer's life that the litmus test for the world to know we are Christians. And that is that we have love one to another. Throughout the Word of God, we are admonished to show love. Romans 12, 9 and following says, let love be without dissimulation or hypocrisy. Romans 13, 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. Romans 13, 10 says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. That means we do not do anything to harm our neighbor directly or indirectly. And let me just give you this one for free. During this pandemic that is still growing, we've been asked to wear masks and social distance in public places. And many people have found that a problem and claim that their rights are being trampled on by being asked to do so. And sad to say, it's a lot of professed Christians doing the complaining. But what about looking at that in light of this passage of scripture? If you want to show love and work no ill to your neighbor, you should also want to protect them from the possibility of getting infected. And if a mask will do that, then show somebody some love and wear your mask. Then 1 John chapter 4 gives us a detailed look at how our love for one another should be predicated upon our love for God. You know, the world is full of people on their way to hell. So you need to love the hell out of people. No pun intended. Yes, Paul here thanked God for their faith. And he thanked God for their love for all the saints. But finally, Paul thanked God for the hope which is laid up for us in heaven. When we consider these three things which Paul was thankful, we can't help but see that these are the three things, or the three abiding virtues mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, namely faith, hope, and love. You see, faith rests upon the past. Love works in the present, but hope looks toward and presses on to the future. Now, to appreciate how important hope is, we need to remember Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15 and 8 that says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. See, he admits here that if all there is to Christianity is in this present life only, then we are miserable. If you are resigned just to this life only, then you don't understand the Christian hope. 
because the consistent teaching of the Word of God is that the full and complete blessing of the Christian life is on the other side. You see, God's purpose in salvation is for us to be like Christ and to see Him in His full glory one day. And He's given us the Holy Spirit as our earnest or down payment for our guaranteed inheritance. Hope in God keeps us on track. John said in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We sing a hymn that says, Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home and last, ever to rejoice. Yes, our hope should be steadfast in its aim to see our blessed Lord face to face. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead, one of his post-resurrection appearances was to his disciples in a closed room. Everybody was there except Thomas. And when they told Thomas they had seen the Lord, he said, unless I see the prince in his hand and thrust my hand in his side, I won't believe. Well, a few days later, Jesus appeared to the disciples again in that same room. And he went straight to Thomas and said, here you go, Thomas. Be not faithless, but believe. Thomas cried out, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus said something that we can be thankful for and rejoice about. He said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Well, as I told brothers and sisters, listen, we are the ones who are not there to see, but we can believe. Believe that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. Believe that he lived a sinless life in obedience to his Father. Believe that he performed signs and wonders, proving that he indeed was a son of God. Believe that he suffered in the hands of evil men. Believe that he was nailed to an old rugged cross and crucified. Believe that he died for the salvation of sinners and the justice of God. But believe also that he was buried in a borrowed tomb. But also believe that early Sunday morning, he arose from the dead with all power and authority in his hand. And listen, my brothers and sisters, if you believe that, then you've got something to be thankful for. I don't know about you, but I want to see him one day. I want to be able to see my Savior face to face. But until that time comes, I'm going to be thankful for God for faith in Christ Jesus. I'm going to be thankful to God for the love for all saints. And I'm going to be thankful for the assurance of a hope that we have in Him in eternity. My brothers and sisters, that's something to be thankful for. Let's pray. God, we are grateful that you are a faithful God, a mutable, unchanging God. That while you give us things to be thankful for, we just need to thank you because of who you are. Thank you for the faith that you give to us through Jesus Christ. We thank you for love that spreads from heart to heart and breast to breast. And thank you most of all for the hope that we have in eternity. Help us to always live for you and live in such a way that we will radiate your love and give others an opportunity to come to know the Christ that we know. We bless you this day. We thank you this day. We glorify you this day. And we pray you be pleased with our lives and all we do. We ask you in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, as we go away, let's remember what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our hearts have felt. Don't forget to forgive somebody because someone needs forgiveness now. And as the opportunity presents itself, Share the love of Jesus Christ with those you come in contact with. And remember, at Jerusalem, we are ministry with eternity 
坚定。